plane like this is kind of what you would have seen in, in like your grandfather's garage or something like that. Um, and it may not be obvious what the difference is, but the main difference here is the angle that the blade's at. So here's the blade um, and, and the mechanism by which you move it is basically the main difference here. So this is called a low angle plane. Um, you can see the blade sits at a low angle in the, in the, the body of the plane. And this is just your standard, uh, it's called a bevel down plane. And that's because if you look right here, you can see there's a bevel on the blade. Um, and that is up in this scenario. Whereas in this one, it's down. And all that is about is what it's, is what it's doing is it's setting the, the attack angle of, of your cut when you're, when you're using the plane. Um, but that's not really useful right now as, as a piece of information because all we're going to do now is talk about how you take a board that looks like this and make it into a board that might look a little more square. Um, and this is a good this is a good example of a piece a piece of wood that you might come across in your shop because you can see it's got this like extreme extreme cup in it. It's really rough. Like this is what almost the wood got more thickness in the middle. It seems like uh, yeah, it's it's all out of whack. And the reason why it's you can pass that around. The reason it's like that is because it's a Pine it was song. a it was a thicker piece that I resawed. And then when that happens, sometimes the moisture gets in and it cups and does that kind of thing. Um, so. Um, okay, I was, I'm sorry, I was starting down the, the plane. So you, they're all different sizes, right? Um, but they all work on the same premise. I mean, technically, you could use this thing as a little block plane. You could use this to make this flat on all sides. Um, it would take a long time. It would take quite a bit of skill. You probably wouldn't enjoy it. Um, <laughs> how long is so a long time? You might. Uh, I don't even know how long it would take me. I might like even hours? Be able to get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would take, it would be, it'd be really hard. Um, it's, it's difficult because technically with a, with a hand plane, because of how they work, you can't, it's theoretically impossible to get a board flat because the blade always sticks out from the bottom of the, of the plane. And, and if, you, if you keep using the plane on the board, no matter what, it's always going to take the high spots off. And so it's possible to go from flat to less flat and make a, you know, a cavity in the board, for example. Um, and so most of what... Uh, most of what using hand planes is about is knowing you know, how close to flat you are um, and, and just tuning the depth of your cut and how many passes you're taking across the board and whether or not you're getting a full shading across the board all the way across the width and so on. Um, but that's why, that's one of the, the hard things about you know, taking a board down to flatness. And we'll see why, you know, why that comes up uh, as you're doing things. Um, also on the sizes, uh, you may have heard of like Stanley, they make planes, um, and there's a numbering system, one through eight. Um, you don't need all eight of them, and there's even more than eight, um, but generally there's, there's a few that are just always in your collection. Um, this is usually one of the first ones people buy. This is called a smoothing plane, or number four. Um, this is uh, a jack plane. You can consider it like a number five or number six, but this one actually has a specific number in the Stanley numbering system because it's a low angle, and Stanley also made a low angle one. Um, and then this is a jointer plane, or a number seven. They make them even longer than this, as in, in a number eight. Um, and this is what you'd use for either really long boards or the edges of boards. Um, another common operation when you want to take two boards and join them together. Um, and then little block plane. Also one of the first you know, go-to planes that people get um, because you can use these in all kinds of situations. You can use it on end grain or to fine up joinery and, and that. And this is, a, this is a, a specifically unique one because it's, you can see the blade goes all the way to the side of the body right there. So it's a rabbiting uh, block plane. And uh, a rabbit is just a, a groove on the end of a board so you can get right into tight spaces. All right, so here's a piece of cherry. And let's say I want to make the, the bottom of a box or something. Um, and so I need to get this flat. One thing that will, you'll, the first thing you'll realize is like, so I can't, you can't set it right here, right? And you can't plane that side. I can plane this side, right? But I can't plane this side. So I'm almost like almost got to start on this side, right? um, because of the, uh, you know you can shim it so it doesn't rock, and sometimes you'll do that depending on you know the piece of wood you have. But we're not going to do that today. So what I need to do is I need to know which direction the grain is going, because when you're using a plane, uh, you can either go with the grain or against it. It's like petting a cat. So when a tree grows, right, it's growing up like this, and it's, it's growing up in cones. And so the cones 
if you want to pet the tree and the tree is going to like it, you want to pet it down the outside and pet it up the inside. And so what you're trying to figure out is where in the tree was this, was this board. Um, and this is somewhat of an art. It's not an art that I've perfected, but uh, you can, there's certain clues you can use. For example, this is, this is cupped. And it will always cup away from the inside of the tree. So I know that this, this is the inside of the tree. And now I need to find where the top of the tree is. And see, this, this has these cathedral, this cathedral pattern. Those always go up. Um, it's kind of deceptive because this could be a knot, and so that might, might not tell me, really. But I am pretty sure that that's not a knot, that this is actually a cathedral shape. You can see, I marked it out so you can see right here. That's that cathedral, so that's it going up. Um, so that gives me the clue that we are going to, but this is this side, so that means I'm going this way, and now I'm on this side, so I'm going to go the opposite direction. Um, if you have a lot of material to remove, uh, you can use what's called a scrub plane, and you can see this plane, it has, I don't know if you can see, but you can, you can actually see the blade protruding out. It. It's a really mm -hmm. deep cut. The blade has a, a camber on it. So it's really curved, and its goal is, its whole mission is to remove lots of material all at once. Um, and so what, you'll, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to get this, this flat so we can set it down and then work this side. Um, and in order, to get a, in order to get the surface flat, we have to create a hollow somewhere. Because what will happen, let's say if we, if we started to attack this, and this is humped, remember, if we started to attack it, um, the plane is just gonna ride over the hump. You see, and we'll never we'll never be able to get it flat because all we're going to do is make that hump more and more extreme. So what we need to do is create a hollow, and we're going to create a hollow by we just just hog out the middle of the board with this. So we'll just we'll just attack it. One of the cool things about the scrub plane is it creates. I'm going to be wrong on this one. Yeah, it's actually. It can be really hard, especially when um, certain woods will change direction on you in the middle of the board. Or... You can see that, that looks much better than the way I was doing it. You can actually feel it. If you guys want to feel it, you can, you can see these shavings that it makes. It's like, oh, wow. That's nice. You can see it, it's even looking better, too. It's just a piece of wood in general. Though. So, and I can even take a little bit. So, I'll keep doing this. Good exercise. So you keep doing that until you have a hollow, which I don't have yet across the board. But you'll use you can use your straight edge to see. See, I'm still high over here. Um, and then once it's like that, you'll be able to take down those edges and make it flat. And I'm going to show you what that looks like later with the other board. Um, one other thing that will happen is boards can be, they can be in a line. So for example, this, this point can be higher than this point, and the board can do this twisting sort of corkscrew kind of motion. And so what you use is you use winding sticks. And you can see these have this silver right here, and then there is a, a complementary one, and you just make them oppose each other. And because they're long, if you sight down, you go over here and you kneel down. And you can see, oh, that you know that's higher because more of the silver is showing, and that'll tell you that oh, I need to knock down this corner because they exaggerate that wind in the board. Most people make their own. I, I'm lazy, so I, I bought. Um, so that's another thing that you'll do at this particular point. I'm not going to take this all the way down to flat because. Uh, it's hot down here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, cooking show magic, we have, uh, we have a flat board. Um, so now, never know if it's the, my board or the... So now, we have to make, um, we have to get one of our edges trued up to this face. So this is now a reference face. So we know that we're, this is a face that we're going we're gonna to now reference off of to make other, other things you know, square to it. So what you'll do then is you'll you'll t pick an edge. So I'm gonna I'm looking at the green. <laughs> Three. It's the five minute buzzer. Uh, 
you can see the grain kind of looks like it's rising up that way. So I'm going to go this way and hope that that's the, the direction the, the grain is going. This. These are called holdfasts, just pieces of steel. Um, you put them in these holes. Hello. Oh. Hey, hey, man. Bye -bye. Yeah? yeah? Come on in. You put them in these holes called dog holes, and then you just whack them, and they hold the board pretty steady. Um, this board, you know, if you had a longer board, you, you could use the jointer. This is small enough that the jack will work. Um, and all you're going to do here is got like that. So what we need to do first, we need to make a hollow in it the same way we would have done on the face. I'm taking a really big cut right here because I took the blade out earlier. So let me do this. This is one of the tricky parts. You have to make sure that it's horizontal, it's straight across. Um, what the old timers would do is they'd get a white piece of paper and put it right here because then you can see the blade a little easier. Take no cut. All right, and then we're going to take out a hollow. Remember, we have, we can't, we can only plane down to flat. We can't make a hump flat. This is the nature of, of how a plane works. So, with this plane, you can actually use this as a straight edge. So I've got, you can see a little bit of light peeking through, and so that's that's enough. And then, and you can actually hear it. It's really tactile, so you can hear the shading start here and end, and there's no shading in the middle. Well, that one was the whole thing. So the way that you got it to cut out in the middle was by starting the cut further in the board or right. by and pushing even, harder can, at different times? I even make the, um, I'm not, I, in general, whenever you're using a plane, you're always applying, it's, um, it's kind of like you're trying to dig out the middle of the board, almost always, because um, otherwise, if you put too much pressure here, you'll end up making a hump, mm. and then down here, you'll end up making a hump. So generally, you're, all my pressure's here, and then right here, it's almost like you, you don't have any, you can still be pressing down, but you definitely won't be pressing down when you come off the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I can even just push the blade out more just to get this even more hollow. Or, uh, or use the scrub plane or whatever. Um, part of what you're doing here too, since we want to get that, since we're going to reference off of this, we're going to make sure this is 90 to this. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to do, I'm actually, I'm actually pretty good right now, but um, I'm not going to do that. We're just going to show you the principles because this, I mean, hand tools are, they're, they're slow, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And I definitely wouldn't say I know what I'm doing. I just know the principles. So, <laughs> um, and you can just sort of apply pressure differentially to, to make that square if it's not square. Well, so if it's like this, oh. if it's square off that. So you can, you can move, um, ideally for this operation, this would have a camber in the blade. And then by moving this, I could take more of a cut on this side or on this side. So what I have to do, because this doesn't have any camber, is I move it over and knock down a corner. But you need to be careful of that because you end up creating like a faceted sort of top. And so it's a little tricky. It's not impossible, but it would, this, this is much easier if you have a camber on your blade. Um, but it's not about pressure uh, so much, but it can be. If like you're really you know, sensitive to the amount of pressure you're putting on you know, it's not like if, you, if I move my thumb or whatever. I mean, you can do that. It's, it is that sensitive of a, of a tool. Um, so listen, if you listen for it, you hear that mm -hmm. like, it's like, the beginning. Of the yeah. So, so I'm going to take, And so now technically, if our, you know, see I'm still actually, I'm a little high on the side, on my side, you can kind of see a little bit of light peeking through. But we would call that, once we're done with that, we'd call that our next reference face. Um, and you put little marks, you can see this little mark right here, this is the face mark. 
There's a little like V looking shape you put on your, your reference edge. So now it's the face. And we made this flat. And now let's say we need a certain thickness of board. Um, when, you, when you're doing hand tools, you tend not to say, oh, I need a, a piece of wood that's, you know, you know, seven inch, seven eighths inch thick or you know, five six, you know, five sixteenths or something. It's just like what as long as all the pieces that I'm gonna use for a particular function are the, generally the same size, sometimes they don't even need to be that close. Um, because you're doing everything by hand, you're not setting up machines to make cuts. You're doing everything, you know, everything's individual to that particular situation. Like when you dovetail a board, it doesn't matter if the two ends are the same size because you're gonna do everything differently, you know, the first time you go through it. Um, but if I need a certain thickness out of this and I want to make it easy on myself, I'm going to just find the thickness that means I have to remove the least amount of wood. Um, and so you can take this as a marking gauge. It's just a steel rod. These little tighteners on it. You can move this up and down. It's got a little wheel. It's got a sharp edge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find out where the lowest point of this board is. And that looks like that'll work. Sometimes I give myself a little room because I'm still, you know, an amateur. Um, and it can be really hard if you can't see where you're working down to. And sometimes you just can't help taking a shape of a certain part of the board. So I, I give myself a little room. Um, and then you mark it. And that will be, hopefully, where we'll try to take... Um, because I didn't work this edge, this is a little hard to mark. I could take this down so it's a little hard to get that groove in there. But the idea is that I might have to cut this to width eventually. So that's why I'm not bothering with this edge yet. Um, this. <laughs> I pencil it in um, so I can see it. But like I said, I'm not going to actually do this down here because you can see I'm sweating. So. Um, I use it. Mechanical can be nice for this too. Um, but back to what happened in the first edge, you can see that there's a dramatic oh. cavity in this. Um, and I might even knock that down with the scrub plane or something like that, because that's a lot of wood to be removing. But since I'm not, I'm just going to show you the, the general idea. Um, one thing about this bench is it's a, it's a bench I built based off plans online. It, it, one of the nice things about it is it doesn't require a vise, which is expensive. So there's all these uh, really neat ways to hold wood um, that are actually fairly traditional. So this is called a batten. Um, you can see it's got this little notch. I cut this little notch just now on the bandsaw. And I'm going to use this. Here, whack, hold fast, you can see it holds it in there really good, and this wedges it in there. And so I'm going to traverse this board right now. Is there a name for this kind of bench? Yeah, it's a Nicholson. It's called, if you search for knockdown Nicholson, this exact bench will show up. Um, Nicholson's an English type of bench. This is knockdown because it's got, you can actually take it all apart, it'll lay flat, and you can move it, which is one of the reasons why I built it for for Make Haven, so they, if they ever change locations, it, um, there's lots of other benches, for example, a Rebeau that is. I mean, he's gonna have a hell of a time moving his Rebeau bench when he has to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm gonna traverse this. One thing that when you're when you're going this way, you want to cross the grain. Is it'll it'll spelch. It's called spelching. So you can see, like it just tears out, and that creates a really horrible edge. So one thing you'll do is you'll you'll take you take the block plane. Most people would use that, but I want to use the block plane right now. And you can um, you can create like a little bevel or a little camber on this on this edge, and that will help the spelching as I go across. And you might I might need to deepen that as I go, but um, but the idea here is that you can go you can take a lot of material off by going across. I want that. Um, I don't have one of these on my bench. <laughs> I have a. I use one of these. It sits in there, but this has to hold this. In place. Um, and you'll do that, and then you can take this edge and this edge, and you're just going to work it down to these lines. Um, and that is. I mean, and then you'll have you'll have a face here that's that's flat, 
and to the thickness you want. And then the next step is getting the width you need. And if I needed like, let's say I needed a board that was you know that that wide, I could take a plane, take a scrub plane, I could move a lot of a lot of the edge that way. Um, I could saw it. There's lots of things I could do. Um, when you're when you're marking the width, you can use what's called a panel gauge. This is a panel gauge. Um, and you can take this, and this reference is off this reference face the edge that we made. And we can use it to mark where we want to go. And I could, I could saw to that line. I could do, you know, I could plane. I wouldn't plane to that line, but I would probably saw that line. Or whatever. And then I would have a board that's my width. This was flat. This edge is done. I would plane that edge after the sign. And then it's just linked now and, and uh, whatever to get the edges. You can see that this edge is not at all square. So um, what you do there is if it was uh, if I needed a much shorter board, I'd saw it, and then you can get what's called a shooting board. And I may have one here. I have what's called a bench hook, but you can usually improvise with these. Um, so this is, this is a bench hook. Usually you take a board and you saw right here against this. So you can flip this around put a piece of wood like this, and if your plane is tall enough, which it is, you can use this to shoot, I'd use this to hold this in place, and you can use this to shoot this square to this edge. Um, this would take a little while because it's really bad, but that's the general idea of how you deal with like a grain situation. And then you have a board that's uh, this square. Um, I'm fucking sweating. It's hot now. <laughs> Um, that's about it. I was going to let you guys, if you guys wanted to try the play out, this is a piece of sugar pine. It smells great, if you want to pass it around. Um, and it's really easy to play, it's really forgiving. Uh, it's like butter. If you guys want to try the play out, you play it, play it, you can. Can you give like a, a one minute rundown on how you choose between the different planes that you've got there? Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, usually, for example, choosing between these two, my, my joiner, and my jack, almost always my biggest my biggest choice personally is the length of the board I'm dealing with. Um, if it's longer than this one, I'm going to choose this one. I don't I don't have I, some people make changes to how their jack plane works so that they or they would always have to turn to this plane. These two in my particular tool set function very similarly, um, and I just I just choose the one for the, the length of board I need. Um, this one. Back to, back to the idea that it's impossible to get a board truly flat with a hand plane, theoretically. This one, because it's so long, um, it rides the hills of the board, right? So that means that as it's cutting, it's only gonna be able to cut hills that are, that are peaks along its length. And so that's why um, you, you, know, if you're, you might set this down on a board and take a pass and not be able to cut anything because the board is, you know, Mostly, you know, it's it's all the hills are keeping the you know the, the blade away except for the parts where you act and actually like where the hills at you know cut them down. Um, so I generally would you know I, I use this thing all the time. There's a reason why it's called a jack plane. Most people buy what's called a smoothing plane first, and this plane's this plane's job is to get rid of sandpaper. Like if you don't like to use sandpaper, this is the plane you grab because it's it's almost always your sharpest plane. It is going to be your most finely set plane so that it's taking a, almost like we're talking like a micron thick um, cut uh, and and so this is what you're using to get the board like really smooth to the touch you know you're, you're trying to replace sandpaper basically um, so this is the last plane you use on a piece of wood um, and this typically after you've done all your joinery so after you've done any dovetailing after you've done you know mortising tenoning because you know if you've done any anything like that it's going to beat the board up and so you don't want to you don't want to sand it until you're done. You don't want to use a smoothing plane until you're done. So uh, this is the one you'll you'll tend to use for, for the last the last plane that touches the the board. Because um, most people buy this because they don't want to deal with sandpaper anymore. You can see I can take I'm, there's a pencil mark here. You can see you can take really. I mean I can go over the pencil a few times and it's still there. Um, and you can see I'm not taking a full shaving because this board's not completely flat. Mm -hmm. At least to the depth of my cut, right? Because mm -hmm. if it was flat to the depth of my cut, I would be taking a full shave. But I'm just taking really tiny hills off right now, um, and and it's kind of okay because back to the idea that if you 
you try to play over a hump, you're just gonna make the hump worse. Like this thing's taking such a light cut, you're not gonna take too many passes with it, so it can't make the hump that much worse if you're taking such a light shading. Um, so you're not gonna just, you're not gonna be spending you know hours and hours and hours and hours and hours with this plane. You're just trying to get something that feels good and smooth and has like a nice glossy finish. Um, this one, this one's basically this one, but it's the it's the bevel down version. Um, and so it functions. It's you grab it for the, you grab it at the same time. Like oh, which one do I want? Oh, I'm gonna try to use you know this one, which is a Craftsman, probably made you know 75 years ago, but this blade is, is a brand new blade. Just got it today. Um, and so you know you, you you could use it for anything you'd use that other one on. And you can tell I'm used to the bevel ups because I reach over with this hand instead of using my finger here. Um, I backed this one out because it was so sharp. Are there any safety concerns that you need to? Yeah, you see me do this. Yeah, that never do that. Out. <laughs> um, that's about it. Um, most of the safety, I would say, most of the time when you're talking about safety with hand tools, it's with the chisels. Because you don't ever want to be, you don't ever want to have your hand behind where you're pressing, you know, you're moving your, your body. So, um, like, you'll use you'll use things like this, and you'll chisel this way instead of like holding it, doing this. Um, that's that's the biggest you know no no. Um, the worst I've hurt myself with, with woodworking has been with I was dovetailing, and I had a board. It was up like this, and I was um, I was marking, and I had a really sharp marking knife, and I was marking to do the. Uh, to do the dovetails, and I was holding it. I was holding my, my gauge to do the mark, and I went like this, and my hand slipped, and I ended up cutting a really deep. It just, I was bleeding. I was like, you could hear me. You could hear the explicative from the uh, from the living room, and I ran into the bathroom and had to get, go buy sutures, and it was a it was a bad cut. But that's about it. just keep your hand out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> she was there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just keep your hands out of the way of where whatever you're using would go if something yeah. slipped. That's the that's the biggest consideration. Um, otherwise, things are moving so slow that it's like even with a handsaw. Like I was sawing one time and like I didn't really pay attention and my leg was there and it's like you know it's just your clothes. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, it's probably maybe probably why I'm a hand tool woodworker. You know, I, don't, I, don't find myself, I don't find myself being as careful with hand tools as I was with the tools because the like the, the risk is so low. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like with, hand, with power tools, I was like always thinking three steps ahead and like double checking everything before I did it with, with, with hand tools, it's a little more organic and just kind of like, you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'll do this now, you know, I'll leave that over there. Like it's not, it's not a sequential process, uh, in the way that power tools would be. Um, it's a little more this area, I'm gonna move over here. Maybe I'll do all these at once, but I don't need to. Um, I don't know what else I got. Is he any questions? Um, and, the, and then you asked about the plane. And then, yeah, this has got one purpose and one purpose only, that is remove lots of wood at once. This is a scrub plane. Um, most, a lot of woodworkers don't even own one of these. Like, you can get by without one. Um, I own one because, you know, I like it, it's coming handy. I felt like I needed it. When I, I had a bunch of rough wood, and so I had to get it down to us. And, Get it flatter, and I feel like that sped things up. Um, that's that's it. Cool. Thank you.